Turn now with me, if you would, these words from the scriptures from the pen of the historian in the book of 2 Samuel. You'll be reading from chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. In the spring of the year, the time when kings went out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very, very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. And it was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him. He lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived and sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And jo Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his Lord, and did not go down to his house. And when they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, you have just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, the ark in Israel and Judah remain in booths, and my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife as you live and as your soul lives? I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day, and on the next day, David invited him to eat and to drink in his presence, made him drunk, and in the evening he went out to lie on the couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote to Joab, sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter, he said, send Uriah to the forefront of the, the fiercest fighting, then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant warriors. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite was killed as well. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? We thank you, O oh God, for this day, and we thank you for your spirit in this place, and the spirit that envelops and surrounds us as we look forward to the long-expected king. But be present to us in all of the stories so your people are listening. Be attentive to your servant because he is listening. In the precious and powerful name of Jesus Christ we pray and the people of God all said, Amen. Amen. I have been charged today with developing and delivering a homily. And as all of you know, a homily differs from a sermon by about 45 minutes. <laughs> Somebody say Amen. And so it is that during this day, we, we envelop ourselves, we rehearse, we, we, we celebrate uh, this new season that we're delving into, a season which is new and yet very ancient. And we rehearse the meaning of the greenery that surrounds us because they inform us about the coming of a king, someone who will be born amongst us, Emmanuel, God with us, who will be King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ, the Messiah of God, and we are thankful to God. Uh, but I caution us as we enter the season of Advent, because how many of you know this is a busy season? How many of you are already over busy? Somebody say amen right about here. 
You've already planned what it's going to be. You already bought most of the stuff that's in the freezer. You hope to take it out in enough time for it to thaw before the guests arrive. And you're busy going hither and thither and yon. You've already established the fact that they are now just 22 more shopping days until Christmas. And you're going out and you're pressing the plastic down. Or if you have it, uh, Master Pay or Apple Pay or whatever it is where you just nod at the thing and it spends your money. And you're busy buying stuff for folk that you don't even like. But what I caution us about this season is there are Sundays of Advent, which is a time of thinking, it's a time of reflecting, it's a time of preparing ourselves. And I would not have you rush to Christmas morning because there's a whole lot we need to experience and understand before we get there. That's why we, during this sermon series, have been tracing our way through the genealogy which is given to us in the Gospel of Matthew, which we read several times during the Advent season. And we have picked out peculiar stories from that genealogy, the story of Tamar, the story of Rahab, Last week, the story of Ruth, and in this concluding Sunday, the story of Bathsheba. All of us are familiar with that story, are we not? And and, and I think that uh, this story holds for us a cautionary tale. How is that? Well, it has, in the main, to do with Brother David. Y'all know Brother David? Brother David, as you remember, was a sheep herder. He was one of Jesse's sons. He was the youngest of Jesse's sons. And, and he was on fire for the Lord. Uh, Samuel, 1 Samuel number 13 tells us that he was a man after God's own heart. He was some kind of God-fearing man. And you will remember how the people were out fighting the Philistines and there came this giant named Goliath. Y'all remember Goliath? And and, and David, with his little self, ran up and said, you dare to defy the king of Israel? Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to take this here slingshot. I don't like those things. And he got five smooth stones, and whoop, 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 and threw it and smote him in the head, and, and, and he fell down dead. And then, all of a sudden, David became a hero. The people sang in the streets, did they not, Pam? They said Saul, king at the time, killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. Oh, David was up and about to be somebody, and he just kept going and growing and going and growing, and and, and all of a sudden he found himself king of all Israel. Israel, which had been a loosely confederated tribe of people, now become, in David's time, a great nation. But... In our story today, David is older now. Nobody in here can relate to that. Because the story as it begins says this was the spring of the year, the time when kings would go out to war. And you remember that David was a great what? Warrior. But all, but all of a sudden, when you get a little older, can I, can I get one witness? You'd rather be at home. You know, I I say at my age now, I used to like to go out and play a lot of basketball. Now, I like to go home, sit down on the killer couch, grab the remote, let the TV watch me. Anybody with me here? And I find that my midsection has uh, expanded significantly. I think David was a little paunchy. And and when you are big and well thought of and great, uh, sometimes you get to the point uh, where you think uh, people's olfactory sense does not work when they're around you. I'm going to let that marinate for a minute. Because how many of you know a preacher can't say everything? And he was big and he was great and everybody loved him and he could do no wrong. They loved him and he was sitting around and so he got up off his couch. That's what the story said. 
you're the, the, yeah, after eating a few grapes. And he was just wandering around. And I think David was in the midst of maybe what we might call a midlife crisis. And he was up there saying, oh, 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 oh. Uh, you know, he needed something to get him excited, you know. And, and so he said, you know what I need? People said, no, but he said, I need a BMW 5. <laughs> and so he gets him a BMW 5 from the dealership just to see what it's like, Chris, you know. A except something happened while he was taking a test drive. He had an accident. Somebody died. And not only that, he didn't have no insurance. How many of you know sometimes when we get old and we get crusty, we get bored, we do stupid stuff? And, and, and I call this sermon the golden rule. Why did I say that? Because, you know, the golden rule, as we receive it from Jesus, says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But there's another contemporary iteration of the golden rule that says he who has the gold and I think that's what this story is about that he who had position he who had power he who had gold made the rule because you, you, you know the story he, he was bored doing nothing saw this woman, said, who that? And, and, and I want you to note that there are several places in the story where this thing gets icky. He sent to find out. So somebody knew. And how many of you know that Israel was like Methodism? What do you mean, Clarence? I mean... There are no secrets in Methodism. I always say Methodism like a bad refrigerator. Can't keep nothing. And so somebody knew because somebody had to report to him who she was. And who was she? She was Bathsheba, whose name means daughter of promise. And she was the wife of Uriah, whose, whose name means Yahweh is my light. And he didn't care about none of all that. He said, bring her here. That's H-E-A-H. -H. And had his way. And then subsequently she left and sent back a, the complication. This is the icky part. She said, I am. And beyond that, he said, well... Uh, let's uncomplicate this. Send me Uriah. Uriah comes. Uriah won't go home. Dang. Say, okay. Cover up. Joab, send him out there where he's going to get shot at. Uriah dies, and in the process, other innocent people die as well. And then subsequently, he marries her. But at the end of the day, he's found out. Why am I shortening and condensing this? Well, first of all, because it's a homily. <laughs> and secondly, because part of our consideration in this season, while we rejoice at the coming of a Savior, we need to figure out why we needed a Savior in the first place. Can I get one amen in the back? And, 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 and so it is that we need to examine the David in ourselves. Because how many of you know in this day and age, the curtain is being pulled back? If you watch the news, you can't help but see it. Am I right? If you're a Today Show addict like I am, are, are you with me here? We need a Savior. And that is what this season is about, preparing ourselves. And part of that preparing is repenting. Part of that preparing is confessing. 
And part of it is preparing ourselves in new ways to receive the love of God that is always present to us. And part of that we do at the table of the Lord. Because as we come to the table of the Lord, the first thing we do is confess. The liturgy goes, if we would but confess our sins, God is righteous and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I invite you to a moment of silence when you might confess your sins. And then I share with you that there's good news that in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And then we do what's called the rehearsal of salvation history. When we think about all the ways God has been present to the people of God throughout history and how one day, 2,000 years ago, Jesus was at table with his friends. And he took bread, <clears throat> and he broke that bread. And he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this is my body, broken for, somebody say everybody, everybody. He said, as often as you sit at table and eat this bread, do so in remembrance of me. Likewise, after that supper, he took a cup and he gave God thanks and praise and he gave that cup to his friends and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood shed for you and for everyone for the forgiveness of sin. He said, as often as you drink from this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Can we remember this today? And then we pray, Almighty God, we thank you for these, your mighty acts in your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray right now that your Holy Spirit fill this place and land upon all of your people, but particularly and especially, O oh God, upon these, your gifts of bread and wine. And we ask that you might make them be for us, the body of Christ, so that we might be for your broken and hurting world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your power, we ask that you make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all of your world until Christ comes again and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory are ever yours, almighty God, now and forever. And the people of God all said, amen. amen. And now let us share together in the price that Jesus, the prayer that Jesus gave to disciples of every age. As we say now together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 